fantastic. Rocking, we're like rocking CF shirts today. This is awesome. I love it. Very, very cool. Um, folks, I just wanted to mention today's session is being recorded. It's going to be up on YouTube as soon as we can get it up there. Audio is being broadcast in voice over IP. Please use your computer speakers. Um, while you're in there, we're going to have a chat pod where you can just kind of like mix it up with all of the other attendees. But if you have questions, there is a Q&A pod that will help Nolan actually pick out the questions from a chat pod that's going to be full of other stuff. And finally, your microphone is muted, so if you want to sing Frozen constantly back and forth, not you, Nolan, you can go ahead and do that. All right, let's move into your talk screen. Go ahead and pop your share up. Let's make sure that things are there. Working on that. Let's see here. There we go, CFML Design Patterns and Uses. I can see it. Take it away, Nolan. Outstanding. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Nolan Irk, and we're going to go over CFML design patterns today and show you some different places where you might use them in your applications. <clears throat> the obligatory ego slide, uh, I run south of Shasta. It's my developer consultancy business. I've been doing that for about 15 years. It's currently me and three other web developers. We work on um, mostly CFML stuff, but I've also done various things over the years uh, that are not CF. I run a local tech meetup called SAC Interactive. We meet once a month to go over sometimes Adobe related stuff, sometimes not Adobe related stuff. Uh, before I got into the web, I used to program video games until I realized that was way too much work for not nearly enough money. And uh, I'm willing to bet I go to more concerts than any five people currently watching this attend uh, this talk. My house looks about like that. I'm a pretty big music junkie. I'm quite proud of my record collection. Uh, there's going to be lots of code that we're going to look at, and I'm going to bounce back and forth between different windows in VS code while I'm doing the talk today. If you want to look at the code yourself directly in a different window, or you want to download all these demos later for your own purposes, that's my GitHub. And that's the repo you're looking for over on GitHub to grab all of the code demos and slides that we're going to go over today. So just make a note of that and you can have everything we're looking at later on, uh, free of charge. <clears throat> So some prerequisites for today's talk. Uh, hopefully you have some experience using CF components. You do not need to be an expert in them though. Hopefully you know how to like make a CFC using either create object or the new operator. You know what methods do. You know how to write a method that passes arguments in and out of it using like CF return. Um, you do not need to be using an MVC framework for any of the talks or, or uh, demos we're gonna look at today. And you do not have to be using an MVC framework in your current application for any of the stuff that we're doing as well. All of these things will work in any CFML application that's using components. It doesn't even have to be all components. It can be like most of our code is still legacy CFM pages with table-based HTML, but we have this one spot over off to the side that a newer developer wrote using components. You can put your design pattern stuff to use in there. Uh, another thing to keep in mind while we do this is object-oriented programming is hard. Some of these concepts we're going to go over will be new to you. Uh, hopefully not too crazy new and, or challenging, but there are different things in OO programming that cause everyone to stumble at some point during their journey in learning object-oriented programming, whether it's learning what composition does or how an interface works or some other facet of it. Um, parts of it get kind of challenging. That is totally normal. Every developer that learns object-oriented programming has some facet of OOP that causes them to stumble a little bit. Any developer who tells you, nope, everything worked perfectly the first time I understood it all, the first time I heard these topics, they are lying to you. So do not feel bad if some of this stuff seems a little bit confusing at the beginning. Uh, so today's agenda, we're going to go over a description of what are design patterns and when you might want to use them. And most of the time, we're going to look at some common design patterns. I'm going to show you code examples that are distilled down into small enough chunks of code that we can look at on a couple of slides and spend just you know three or four minutes a piece on them here in presentation land. Uh, and then I'll give you a few points of reference for like, here's places where you might use them in more of a real world setting, where you take the exact same pattern we're going over today and then just wrap that pattern around the actual business logic in your application. We'll give you some examples on when to use those. Uh, I'll also give you some other tips and point you towards some other resources that might be useful uh, to continue learning design pattern stuff later on your own. 
So what is a design pattern? Uh, that's a big fancy word for a way to organize your classes so they work together in kind of a flexible, reusable way. You can think of it a lot like a for loop or an if statement or array in your code. Um, a for loop doesn't care what you're looping over. That's a reusable construct. I can loop over email addresses or CF components. I can loop over a list of user IDs. The for loop is just a generic reusable thing, just like an array. An array doesn't care what I'm putting in the array. It can be an array of email addresses, an array of user IDs or whatever. It's a reusable thing. Um, I can just take advantage of that when I need to in my application. There are lots of design patterns. Uh, here are names of several of them. We're gonna go over some, but not all of these in today's talk. And there are several more design patterns above and beyond this list of them that we have here. Some of them you may never ever actually use in your application. It has been quite some time since I've had to build a finite state machine in some of my code. Whereas I use singletons and factory pattern uh, pretty regularly. So it just depends on what you're building, what kind of design you have in your application. Um, some of these may be more common in your app than others, just depending on what you're doing. <clears throat> design patterns are not platform specific. All of the concepts we're going to go over today work in ColdFusion, Java, .NET, JavaScript, C++, several other OO languages. Most, if not all, OOP languages can do some variation of these design patterns. The actual syntax you type will obviously be different from language to language, like where the commas and semicolons go and such. But the naming conventions and the overall design is pretty much the same across all of these tools. Uh, if I'm talking to a .NET or C++ developer, for example, and I'm talking about the singleton design pattern, it means the exact same thing in .NET and C++ as it does in ColdFusion. Same goes with the model view controller design pattern or factory or template method or whatever else. The syntax will be a little bit different but the problem we're solving is the exact same type of problem. So the very reusable and the knowledge you learn here will transfer over to uh, any other languages that you happen to be dealing with on maybe other applications and such. None of the things we're talking about require using an MVC framework. You can use all of these design patterns by themselves. You do not have to be using Coldbox or Framework 1. I'll say that one more time. You do not have to be using an OOP MVC framework to do any of these things. Um, you don't even have to use them all together at the same time. You can mix and match just like any other construct in your code. Like just because I use an array doesn't mean I have to use a for loop somewhere in my code. I can use one to solve a problem. I can use the other to solve a problem. I can combine them if that would do something for me. Same thing with design patterns. Pick the design pattern or patterns that help you and ignore the rest of them. I promise they're not as scary as maybe they have appeared in the past. And with that, we're going to look at some, some code. Uh, we'll start with Singleton, which I bet a lot of you are already using the Singleton design pattern, and maybe you don't even realize it. Uh, the Singleton ensures that one and only one copy of a CFC gets created and used by your entire application. So if I have like 20 different .cfm files in my app that users can go to in their browser and run code, um, I want to make sure that all 20 of those different templates all use the same instance of a CF component. I want to create it once, store it somewhere so that all 20 of them can actually use it. We're going to take a look at some code and see how that works now. Uh, here's my singleton example. I've got an index page, and it just redirects me to this metal page over here. I'm going to open that up in a browser. And there it is. So you can see I have a list of music genres. I'm on the metal page now. And here's a list of metal bands. You're going to get lots of pop culture references in my demos today. Uh, that's just how I roll. And if I click over on punk, you can see it changes to a list of punk bands and synth pop does the same thing. We just changed to a different page. And you'll notice that in metal, punk, and synth pop, the code all looks pretty similar. I've got a title, I've got my custom tag for my nav, page title, and a loop that's looping over whatever's coming back from the appropriate function. Get metal bands, get punk bands get synth pop bands. Notice that all three of these methods are coming out of an object called music utilities. It's stored in the application scope. Notice how on none of these pages am I calling create object or new to make an instance of music utilities. That happened in my application CFC. I called on application start. I created one instance of this music utilities, stored it in my application scope, and then my entire application can use it. That's my singleton pattern. I made one, I found a chunk of code that runs once for the entire application. 
created this component and stored it in my application scope. So I have one and only one copy of it being shared by everything in my application. Anytime you do this, you call your on application start method because that runs once when the app starts up and then it never runs again while your application is live. Um, so you're guaranteed this code runs one time. When you put things in the application scope, you're guaranteed there's one copy of them when it runs this way. So I can make a component and rather than storing it in a variables scoped uh, variable like in the actual .cm page itself or storing it in request or some other place, put it in the application scope. Then it lives in one spot and all the different pages in my app can use it. I have a single copy of this music utility component and everybody uses it. That's my singleton example. Just to show you the code again, it is running, I promise. There's my singleton. Let me close these down. We'll start with the easy one and we'll get a little fancier as we continue on. Uh, let's go back here. All right, so there's singleton. <clears throat> strategy pattern, a little bit fancier. Uh, strategy is for when you have classes that are sort of the same, but not exactly the same enough for inheritance to be useful. Uh, hopefully everyone knows what inheritance does. That's the is a construct with components where I have, I might have like an employee component and then I have manager, intern, and VP. And those are types of employees, right? So I might have an um, employee class and I have a manager class. Manager extends employee because manager is a type of employee. Uh, that's how inheritance works. And that's fine when all of the child classes need to behave exactly the same. Um, that works great. Strategy is for when, well, they're similar, but they're not exactly the same. Some functionality, all of them can use some functionality. We need to tweak it along the way to make sure that it works properly for the different CFCs on our system. And ducks are a good example of how that would work. <clears throat> so let's talk about actual ducks uh, for a minute. Um, four things ducks could do are fly, swim, quack, and eat. So if I built a duck CFC, I would have four methods in it, fly, swim, quack, and eat, because that's the things that ducks can do. Makes sense so far. Can all ducks fly, swim, quack, and eat? I don't see why not. Well, what about rubber duck toys like you would have in the bathtub for your kid? Uh, they don't fly. Rubber ducks don't swim, although they do float, which I guess you could make an argument is a variation of swimming for that's specific to rubber ducks. They don't quack either. But if I squeeze the rubber duck toy, it makes a squeak noise. And you can make an argument that that is the rubber duck's version of quack. And they don't eat anything. So two of these don't really make sense at all for the rubber duck version of my duck component. And two of them work, but we would have to tweak the functionality in those to make it more rubber duck specific. What about wooden decoy ducks like hunters would use out in a, um, a marsh or something? Well, they don't fly at all. They don't swim, but again, wooden decoys float in the water, which you could make an argument is their version of swim. They don't quack and they don't eat. So in the case of this one, only one of these methods works, but it still needs some massaging of the functionality before it would actually be correct for this one. And the other three items in here don't work at all. Let's take a look at some code and see how this works. I'm gonna close down my singleton from before. I'm gonna turn off the singleton demo and turn on my strategy demo. So start. I happened to put the demos in individual command box servers just because that's how I built the demos. You don't have to do that. There's no problem with having multiple design patterns all in one application. I just kept them all as separate servers for um, the path of least resistance when I was building out the code samples. All right, let's look at strategy. Strategy is here. You can see we have a few CFCs. I've got my duck. And we've got some types of ducks. I have mallard, rubber duck, and wooden decoy. We're going to start with wooden decoy. So wooden decoy extends duck. Well, what does duck look like? Duck has a color. So all of them can be have a color of some sort, whether it's the plastic shell on the outside or actual feathers or whatever. And we've got a constructor that simply sets that color and returns us back an instance of the object. Wooden decoy is a duck. It extends that. So if this wooden decoy gets a color property set to it, and I have a constructor in here I can use to create that, although this doesn't really need to be here because I have a constructor here in the parent class, but whatever. And wooden decoys can swim, but we've decided that they don't really swim in the traditional sense that like maybe a mallard would. So we have a swim method here and it does whatever it does here. <clears throat> Notice up here in my, uh, on line one of my wooden decoy, I've got this implements I swimmable 
iSwimmable is an interface. We've got a CFC down here. This is iSwimmable. Open that up and you can see it's not a component, it's an interface. And the only thing in this CFC file, this interface, is the name of a method or a method signature. There's no curly braces here. There's no stuff actually in that method. Uh, this is an interface. When you have a component that says it implements that interface, what you're telling the Cold Fusion comp compiler or engine is any method names inside that file, I promise I will make a method in my component that looks exactly like that. It would be a public any function swim that takes no arguments. So here in decoy, I have public any function swim that takes no arguments and it does something. Let's open up index, drag that over here. You can see I'm making an instance of wooden decoy, giving it a brown color, and I'm calling that swim method and that's all it does right now. If I go back here and reload the page, you can see that it runs exactly how we expect it to run. Now let's take a look at rubber duck. Rubber duck also has a constructor to set the color for duck. Although again, I could get rid of this constructor and just use the one in the parent class, but I didn't. Rubber ducks swim, same concept as before. That means that because I'm following the I swimmable interface, I will have a public any function swim method that takes no arguments. It's right there. And now I have code that is the specific version of swim functionality that just works for rubber ducks. The duck is floating in the tub. Let's turn this on. And go back over here, reload this. And now we have our wooden mallard, from, our wooden decoy from before, and our rubber duck code is working. You can see that the functionality is a little bit different for one type versus the other type, but they both have swim methods that do the version of swimming that they both need. And they're both ducks. Right. Like that. In addition to swim, my rubber duck class implements iQuackable over here. And let's take a look at iQuackable. And that is an interface, same as before, that has one method signature in it, public any function quack. And what that means is the same thing, just like because we implemented iSwimmable, that means I will have a public any function called swim. It also means, that also means I will have a public any function called quack that does something and returns that functionality back to the calling template. I will uncomment this line of code right now and rerun that. And we have our squeak functionality working specific for, or rather our quack functionality working for rubber ducks. Now we have the fancier one, mallards. So mallard can implement, look at that, four interfaces, eat, swim, quackable, and flyable. And they all look how you expect them to look, quackable, swimmable, and then iFlyable is up here. It's got one function in it for, one method signature in it for flying. And I eat has one method signature in it for eating. Close down those guys. So I have some more room to operate here. Mallard, and I'm again, I'm still extending duck and still doing it this way. The reason we do things like this, where we have multiple interfaces in Cold Fusion is because I cannot extend from multiple classes. Cold Fusion is Java based. Uh, Java only allows you to inherit from one class total. You can either inherit from nothing. I can get rid of that extends operator. Or I can say extends from one class and that's it. I cannot, if I tried to go in here and do something like extends duck comma, assume I had an employee CFC somewhere. If I tried to do that, Cold Fusion would yell at me and say, you cannot extend from two things at once. There's a design reason why that's not allowed in Java and Cold Fusion just adopted the same uh, premise when they built Cold Fusion. There's a thing called the diamond design pattern that extending from two classes at one time could cause you to run into that problem. Whereas implementing multiple interfaces works in kind of a similar fashion to multiple inheritance, but it gets around the diamond design problem idea nicely. So that's why we have a bunch of interfaces up here. And now you can see I have four methods here inside my Mallard CFC. I'm going to go back here to my CFM template, uncomment that code, go back to Firefox, reload. And here's my wooden decoy running. Here is my slightly fancier rubber duck running. And here is my super duper fancy Mallard running with all the functionality and the variations of it are specific to Mallard. The method signatures are all the exact same. So the code all works in my CFM template, whether I'm using a wooden decoy, a rubber duck or a Mallard, 
The methods are all named the exact same way. They all take the same type of arguments in. They all return the same type of thing back to the calling chunk of code. Uh, that's how interfaces work. And this is a decent example-ish of uh, what they call the strategy design pattern, using multiple interfaces to build out the different types of uh, types of functionality you need among different components in your application. <clears throat> Real world uses for this kind of thing. You mean you're not building duck simulators at your offices? Uh, you can use this for like payroll systems, like I talked about earlier with different types of employees. Maybe you have a an intern CFC and maybe you have a sales rep CFC. Interns probably get paid like a day rate. Maybe they just get paid $5 a day for parking or something like that. Although I hope none of you are doing that and you're paying your interns well. Uh, you might have a contractor CFC where they don't get health benefits, but they do get an hourly rate or maybe their health benefits are handled by a consulting agency of some sort separately from full-time employees who maybe they get stock options and that sort of thing. So if you have a big fancy payroll system, you might have different CFCs to handle processing payroll and benefits for the different types of people in your organization, but you want the functionality in each of those CFCs to work the same way so that they're interchangeable. And I can plug one type of employee into the payroll module and know that all the code in there is gonna work the exact same way when I plug in the intern component into the payroll module module and so on. Uh, you might also use this for if you're building things like video games. Um, birds probably fly in your application, and I bet spaceships fly too, but I'm going to bet that the code handling how a spaceship flies around in your game works differently than the code handling how a bird flies around in your game. This gives you a way to break out the specific functionality into individual components, but keeping the method signatures the same and having them all inherit, um, implement the same interfaces guarantees that the code will be interchangeable uh, nicely within your code, within your overall application. Uh, factory pattern. Factories are used for when you want to create variations of the same object. Uh, you don't actually use the create object or new operator to make a CFC when you use a factory. You have a factory component and you tell that component, please make me one of these. And then the factory component will make that, it'll call the create object or new operator for you possibly doing some other magic behind the scenes, and it will hand you back the created CFC for you. Uh, the nice thing about factory too, is it only requires one CFC to build a factory. I'm going to close this and turn on my factory demo. Server stop. Factory one, server start. And while that's firing up, Let's go back over here into some code. I'll close these down. Factory one. All right. So factory one starts like this. I have an entertainer factory. It looks like so. Pretty small component. I can construct the component. I've got a method called create entertainer. You simply tell it which type of thing you want it to create. It runs a switch case statement and it creates that type of thing for you. And here's how I'm calling it. Create entertainer, pass it the name of one of the CFCs in my app, musician, author, or actor. If I go over here, when it runs, you can see it's creating a, I'll blow that up a little bit. It's creating a musician. There are the properties inside my musician class, and there are the methods inside it. If I go here to that code and change it from musician to, let's say, actor, save and reload. Now it's created an actor with the methods inside there. Nothing terribly exciting about that demo, but you get the premise of that's what a factory look like, looks like. You tell it, here's the thing I want you to make. Please go find the code for making one of those and do it for me. Well, now let's extend that idea a little bit. I'm going to turn this server off. Server start. And let's look at a real world example of when you might want to take advantage of factories. Here's a slightly more involved factory component. I've got an application CFC. Actually, I'll start with uh, the index file. Um, I have this case, I have a SQL factory. It looks like so. Construct one. And in this case, the constructor takes in the type of database we're running. So MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server, or Oracle. And I have a method called create model and pass it a table name. It's going to go into my models folder right up here. Notice in there, I have three subfolders, one for each database type that I want to support. I'm going to tell it, please go make me a CFC based on whatever table name I passed in there. It's going to go into that models folder, find what database type I have, go find the 
CFC that corresponds to that table. It's going to make one and hand that back to the calling chunk of code, which we have right here. So create model. You can see I've got my factory set to Oracle. The Oracle subfolder is right there. I'm going to say create model. Go get me a customer's thing out of the Oracle system. If I open the Oracle subfolder, you can see I have a customer's CFC in there that does different stuff specific to the Oracle version of um, my application. So you can see the tables here. I'll begin with Oracle underscore. So you can tell when we're running the Oracle specific part of the code. I don't actually have a Docker container with a database running in it right now. I didn't want to deal with creating three Docker containers and configuring ports uh, for the demo when we're not going to spend more than three seconds looking at it um, code-wise anyway. So, But if you see code running with Oracle underscore prefixes on the table names, it's the Oracle version of my code. So let's go back over here. And you can see it is, in fact, running the Oracle version of my code. There's my models.oracle.customers is, in fact, uh, stuff that happens here in the app. If I change it from customers to something else in my uh, factory that it knows how to create musicians, let's go musician, save, and reload that. Now it's creating a musician CFC for me, also in that Oracle subfolder. If I go up here and change Oracle to MySQL and reload my factory page, now it's creating the MySQL version of my musician component. And there's all the methods and stuff inside the MySQL version. I should open that folder so you know I'm not lying to you. There it is. There's a MySQL version of musician. There's no SQL in this one. Let's flip it back to the MySQL customers. So you can see the fancier version of that being created, MySQL customers. And there's all my methods that actually have MySQL specific uh, functionality in them. So this way, I can support different database vendors. None of the code in the main part of my application has to deal with, if you're running on Oracle, do it this way. If you're running on MySQL, do it the other way. If you're running on Microsoft SQL Server, do it this third way. The rest of your application will just use these objects. It'll say, please go make me whatever the appropriate code is for dealing with the customer stuff, whether it's Oracle or MySQL or whatever. Um, when you create the factory, you just tell it once, I'm running on MySQL or I'm running on Oracle or whatever. And then you tell it what kind of thing you want to go make and it'll make that and hand it back to you. And you can just call the methods inside there and run with it. Well, I don't want to do this every time I want to create code that talks to my database. We can combine the singleton pattern we saw earlier with this factory idea. And now we're using both singleton and factory in one line of code. I'll uncomment those, and I'm going to turn off our first example. And now you can see in the application CFC file, just like before, when my app starts up, make an instance of the SQL factory, set it to MySQL, save it. So we have a single copy of our SQL factory being made. And we're going to see if we get the results out on the screen that we expect to get. Save and reload. Look at that. Models MySQL musician. And it is, in fact, running one of the musician-related pieces of functionality inside that component right here in my page. Rehearse, musician.rehearse looks like this. The musician is rehearsing and saving data to the MySQL database. That is what we got over here. If I go back into my application CFC and change MySQL to Oracle and restart my application, Now it's running the Oracle version of my code. Uh, so when might you want to do this? When you support different data database types. Maybe I have a shrink-wrapped application that I want to bundle up and sell to different companies. They provide the database. We just simply drop our app onto their server, configure a couple of things, and they're up and running. Well, this way, I can support multiple database vendors and I can keep all of my stuff that is Oracle specific in one folder, all of my stuff that is MySQL specific in one folder and so on, make a folder for Postgres. If I want to support that later, you get the idea. Rather than having CF query tags scattered all throughout my application, I would never be able to support more than one database vendor if I did it that way. If I do it this way with subfolders and create in a factory, 
all of the code in my application doesn't care what kind of database I'm running on right now. All it cares about is I have a factory that knows what database type we're on. And I tell that factory, go make me a thing, please. I'll get that object back, call the methods inside there as I need to for insert, update, delete, whatever those things are I need to do with my code and we're good. Close these down and that's factories. Super useful. I have used these in that exact scenario in applications before where we made a basically shrink wrapped app that needed to be sold to different outfits, some of which were on Oracle, some of which were on Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, it works quite well. <clears throat> Close these down. And let me turn this one off. All right, adapter pattern is when you have two CSCs that are um, different, but you want them all to run in the same way. Like if you have a giant for loop and you want to be able to loop over a couple of different types of CFCs in one for loop and have them all execute in the same way. <clears throat> but maybe you cannot, for different reasons, go into the components and change the method names to do things. Maybe if I change the method names in one component so they match the second component, the, the two CFCs I'm dealing with match each other. But maybe by changing the method names in one of them, I break functionality elsewhere. So I don't want to actually end up doing that. Um, in that case, one of the things you could do is you can write an adapter CFC that takes the one rogue component, if you will, that's got funny method names, and you can adapt it so that the method names are the same as whatever else is in the rest of your application. Let me turn on my adapter demo. And while that's firing up, we're going to take a look at some code. Adapters. All right, so back to our ducks. I've got a Mallard CSC, it looks like this. Construct it, it's got a fly and a quack method. It implements iDuck just because why not? We used iDuck from our, we used method names, or I'm sorry, interfaces from our previous example. This interface happens to have two methods in it. So any class that implements the iDuck interface has to have both of these method signatures defined in the component that they are, fly and quack. <clears throat> and I can create that here. I've got three mallards. I put them in an array. I loop over everything in the array and I'll put the results to the screen and it looks like you expect it to look. There's my quack method, there's my fly method and I've got two more in my array. Nothing fancy happening there. Let's take a look at this next version of our code. <clears throat> Here I have my mallard class from before and I've got a turkey class. Let's take a look at turkey. Turkey has a constructor. It's got a fly method. It is not implementing the iDuck interface, so it does not have fly and quack, but it does have this goggle, gobble method, which is turkey specific functionality, super technical term there. If I go to try to run this in my index two, let's take a look at what happens here. Make three mallards, make three turkeys, put them all in an array, loop over all of them. Quack is gonna run fine for the mallard. There's my quack method. And when it gets to this item in my array and it runs the quack method, I don't have a quack method here. I have a gobble method instead of quack. Nolan, why don't we just change that to say quack? Well, what if we have other functionality elsewhere in the app that is expecting this method to be named this way? Or worst case, um, even than that, what if this CFC is licensed to us from a third party vendor and we're not legally allowed to change the code in here. Maybe the vendor is kind of a jerk and we know that they're gonna watch us if we change the code, we'll get in a lot of trouble and that sort of thing. If I go to run index two, I'm gonna get a great big error saying, I don't know how to do that. Enter the adapter class. <clears throat> New version of our code, make three mallards, make three turkeys, just like we did previously. <clears throat> now make a turkey adapter CFC that looks like this. The constructor takes a turkey com component in and we just save it for later reference. The turkey adapter is implementing the same interface as the duck. So it's gonna have a fly method and a quack method, which we saw. There's our interface, right? Fly and quack. Here's our uh, quack method. And it's just going to take the turkey that we saved for reference in our constructor and it's gonna call a gobble internally here. So we can call turkey adapter dot quack, and that will in turn call turkey dot gobble, which means we can run this code without having to actually change the name of that method or change how it works at all. We also have a fly method here 
since ducks can fly farther, they do more functionality basically than when the turkey calls its fly method. You can see it can only fly for a short distance. When we call the turkey adapter version of fly, it will actually run the fly method a couple of times. So it is closer in behavior to when an actual duck does the same thing. So back here in our CFM template, create three of our mallards. We didn't have to change any code in that CFC. Create three turkeys. We did not change any code in that CFC. We simply made a new adapter component that takes one of these guys in as an argument, saves it, and then we put those in our array instead. Now we have an array of ducks and adapted turkeys, so they behave like ducks. And when we run all of that functionality back over here, we get all of our duck stuff and we get all of our tricky stuff to run out the other side and it all behaves how we expect it to, no errors. And we did not have to go into either our duck or our turkey components and change anything. <clears throat> you can think of it as the code equivalent of if you've got a two prong uh, jack on the wall in your house, but you have a three prong power outlet you're trying to plug or power adapter you're trying to plug into it, similar kind of concept. Real world uses, uh, swapping vendor libraries in and out of your application. Adapters can be really helpful for that sort of thing. Like I said uh, earlier, if you've got, maybe you've got some, uh, you know, map location services vendor that gave you a bunch of code that is working fine, <clears throat> excuse me, but maybe you know, the relationship has soured with that vendor, you want to pull their code out of the system, or you just want to be able to swap one type in for another type. Maybe you have like the standard version of your application and the enterprise version of your application. You want to have vendor A control one of them and vendor B control another one for whatever reason. You can use an adapter to make them both work the exact same way in the rest of your code. None of your developers have to actually change the methods they call or how those methods work. They simply use the adapter instead of using the actual vendor uh, library and everything should work how you expect it to. Decorator pattern. <clears throat> So decorators are useful for adding new behavior to a component. They get rid of the idea that you have to use inheritance for everything. Inheritance is not a horrible thing by itself, but the problem with inheritance is, like we said earlier, you can only inherit from one component. You cannot inherit from two, three, four components. Um, and to change the type of inheritance you have from one component to another requires changing the code and recompiling everything. So inheritance is okay, but um, it doesn't happen at runtime, it happens at compile time, which means if I want to change how two components inherit from each other, I have to ship a new version of my application to do that. I can't just change it at runtime. Uh, decorators can be done at runtime and composition can be done at runtime as well, which is another uh, benefit of using them instead of using inheritance, but we can discuss that another time. Uh, all right. <clears throat> Say we're building code for an espresso machine. We have four types of coffee we want to be able to make at our coffee shop. House blend, dark roast, espresso, and decaf. I'm going to have a house blend CFC. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a frog in my throat today for some reason. I have a dark roast CFC, espresso, and decaf components as well. What if I want to have whipped cream or hazelnut for all four of those? Well, then I would have to have a house blend CFC and a house blend with whipped cream CFC and a house blend with hazelnut CFC and a house blend with whipped cream and hazelnut CFC. So that's four components. Repeat that for the four or the three other types of coffee I have in my system. So instead of having four components representing the four types of coffee, I have to have something like this, house blend, dark roast, espresso, decaf, and then I'd have house blend with whip, dark roast with whip, espresso with whip, and decaf with whip. So I've got eight CFCs if I want to model that kind of functionality in my app. And if I want to do all of those flavors and all of those options together, the amount of components I would have to make real quickly looks something like this. That's way too many CFCs to handle this. Um, I don't want to deal with that. If I have to, if I find a bug in maybe the pricing mechanism in espresso. That means I have to go check 15 other components to figure out if the pricing mechanism is busted in all of those places too. Terrible idea. Can you imagine what would happen too if we added like soy milk to this? Now the matrix gets even bigger. And then what happens if we add coconut milk to this or, or oat milk or whatever? Like it just becomes this giant pile of CFCs that all have 
a lot of code copy pasted between them. Not the right way to do it. So instead, we're going to use what we call the decorator. Come over here. Let me turn off that one and go to my decorator demo. Server start. And while that's firing up, let's go look at some code. Close down all of my duck turkey things. Decorators. All right. First demo, we have an espresso component. It looks like so. Espresso is a beverage. It's got a constructor and it's got a cost method in it. So we can, we'll be able to know how much our espresso costs when we run this code. And that's all we're doing with it up here is we get the description back of what kind of drink is it. And we get back the cost and draw that on the screen. This should work as we expect it to. Nothing crazy happened in there. Let's take a look at that beverage uh, parent class just to say we did. So beverage CFC looks like this. It's got our description property inside it. It's got a basic constructor. Uh, notice that this is an abstract component and it has an abstract method in it called cost. All that means is if I were here in my CFM template and I tried to do new beverage as opposed to new espresso, it would yell at me. When you have an abstract class, you cannot actually make an instance of one of these directly. You have to extend it somewhere and then make an instance of the thing it extends. Um, the reason being there's not enough info in this component to know what kind of beverage we're building here. There's nothing in here that says this is espresso or this is a house blend. It just says, you know, this is a beverage. Um, same thing with the cost method. That's abstract because we don't have enough info yet to know how, what kind of cost mechanism to run here. Is this the espresso or the house blend or something else? It's sort of like a inherited component and an interface at the same time when you have um, inherited functionality, but you also have some stuff you can say, this has to be defined later on. Um, all right, so there's our cost. That all looks good. Let's make a dark roast. And this one, we're doing the same thing here, right? Make an instance of dark roast, get the description of it, and show me how much it costs. Let's look at dark roast CFC. It extends beverage just like espresso does. I've got a constructor, and I've got a cost that's a little bit different. So the functionality in my dark roast cough cost is a little different than the functionality in my espresso cost. Now, and that runs here. I'll show you that I'm not lying to you, espresso and dark roast. All right, now we make an instance of mocha flavoring for our dark roast. Notice how we're passing the dark roast coffee we made up here on line six in as an argument this time and handing it back out the other side of my constructor. The next two lines of code are exactly the same as the ones previously. Call get description, call cost. All I did was I took the coffee we made up on line six decorated it with this mocha class and got one back the other side. Let's see what that looks like. Now check out what happens. Dark roast with mocha flavoring. It's a buck 45. Dark roast is 125. And I bet if we look in our mocha CFC, we're going to see that it is 20 cents. So here's what happens with this mocha one. We pass the beverage type in as an argument into mocha. And then that's our constructor right here. Pass beverages in as an argument, save it for later reference. This has um, now, and I'm sorry, uh, Mocha is a condiment decorator. Let's take a look at condiment decorator. It's got a constructor and it's got an abstract method again called get description. So just anything that implements, I'm sorry, anything that extends condiment decorator is going to have a get description method of its own. Mocha looks like this, get description, take whatever the description was of the beverage we gave you when we constructed this and simply add with Mocha flavoring onto the end of it. Similar when we call the cost method in this beverage condiment decorator, take whatever the cost was of the beverage we gave you and decorate it by adding 20 cents to that, return the whole total back to the calling chunk of code. That runs like this. And that way I can do a dark roast coffee with mocha flavoring and charge for the mocha flavoring without ever having to go into my dark roast CFC and change it. And I also did not have to make a dark roast with mocha flavoring.cfc file. I just take the file that I have before that does everything how it's supposed to and simply add this kind of wrapper around it and draw that out the other side. And that works how we expect it to. Now let's get even fancier with that. We're gonna take that same dark roast we made way up here. We're gonna add the mocha flavoring. We're gonna use soy milk and we're gonna put whipped cream on it. 
and same thing. See, we're passing the same dark roast up here into my soy decorator, hand it back, pass that same dark roast into my whipped cream decorator, and hand it back. Let's take a look at soy and whip and see what those do. So here's soy. Soy is a condiment decorator as well. It works the same way as the mocha one does. Pass in a beverage, save it for later reference, get description and cost methods. Get description, same thing. Take the beverage I gave you and simply add with soy milk to it. Cost, take the beverage I gave you and simply add whatever cost functionality you need to add onto it. Return the whole thing back to the calling chunk of code. That soy, whipped cream is exactly the same. It's also a condiment decorator. Save a beverage for later reference. Get description and cost methods that do the exact same thing that the other one did. But because we're not changing any of these, I can simply call them when I need to. And now when I run that code, foomp, now I have a dark roast mocha with soy milk and whipped cream 280. And each component simply knows how to decorate whatever we gave it, combine all that functionality together, and we get the appropriate um, math to happen and appropriate functionality to appear on the screen like so. And these can all be mixed and matched. There's no order that they have to be called in. If I cut this one and paste it up here, watch what happens. So now we're going whip first and then soy. So here it says soy with whip. When I refresh my page, it just calls them in the different order, but it all works the exact same way. The whipped cream code doesn't know about the soy milk code. The mocha code doesn't know about soy or whipped cream. All any of these decorators know is you're gonna give me a beverage I'm gonna take whatever that beverage is and do something. I'm just gonna simply add my part of the description stuff onto the end of whatever you gave me. You might've given me just a generic house blend, fine. You might've also given me house blend with whipped cream and extra sprinkles and you know 105 degrees temperature, fine. It's gonna take whatever you gave me and do the extra thing on the end, hand it back to the calling chunk of code. We are simply decorating whatever the thing was, whatever the beverage was that got passed in and handing it back to the rest of the code. And notice here too, even after calling two decorators back to back, my CFM template still works the exact same way as it did when all we had was a generic espresso CFC. I call get description, just like I did before. I call dot cost, just like I did before. They all use dollar format the same way. I could change that, I guess, if I wanted to, but you get the idea. So real world uses of that. Uh, anytime you've got a bunch of options like soy milk and whipped cream and extra sprinkles and iced and hot and whatever else, uh, anytime you want to be able to mix and match those different pieces of functionality or options rather around a thing um, in different sequences or turn some of them on and off as the application is running, you can use decorators to do that. So like if I wanted to have logging get turned on and off when some components run, like maybe certain users are beta testers. So I want to add extra logging around tracking what they do in the application. Well, I could decorate that user's component with a logging decorator of some sort. If I have certain parts of the application that need to have tighter security, maybe we're doing something uh, super proprietary in that area. I want to you know, add a new, I can decorate users in there with a security decorator of some sort, polling, two-factor authentication. Um, the guts of how that decorator would work would be more specific to each of these pieces of um, these use cases. So that's why I'm not using those in the demos here, but hopefully you get the idea. You can decorate a component without ever having to change that CSC itself, simply wrap it with a decorator of some sort, and then call the decorator when you need to, to apply the additional functionality. Um, uh, and that's it for the demos of components. Some other tips on design pattern stuff. Don't feel like you have to jump into these head first. Uh, treat them like tools in a toolbox. Just because you know what a for loop does, doesn't mean you have to put a for loop on every .cfm page in your application. If the code you're writing calls for one, great, use it. And if it doesn't, move on. Um, you can use these in any application that have CF components too. It doesn't have to be a, a perfect brand new cold box six application with all the trimmings. It does not have to be framework one with all the magic framework one stuff in there. If you got a couple of components, um, you can use these. Obviously, the more well-architected your components are, the easier it will be to take advantage of some of these items. But um, that all depends on you know your use case and what your code base looks like and things. So just kind of deal with them when it, whatever you can is the short of it. Uh, try to use obvious naming conventions for things. When I make 
a SQL factory in my app. I actually call it SQL factory.cfc. Don't try to get cute and call it like sf.cfc just to save yourself a little bit of typing. You're going to end up annoying all of the developers on your team and driving yourself crazy a year down the line when you can't remember what the FS, SFCFC does. So try to actually name them, you know, clear things so you can tell what they actually do. Uh, we did not discuss dependency injection in this talk. That's another design pattern, basically. And it's also very much worth learning. Uh, you also do not need to use Coldbox or Framework 1 or any MVC framework to take advantage of dependency injection. You can do that with any application that has whatever level of CFC use in it. Uh, I do a different talk about how dependency injection works. If you want more info on that, just go to southorshasta.com and click on presentations. And there's a bunch of stuff up there you can read. Um, and just hit me up if you want me to give that talk for your tech meetup or user group sometime. We can chat about that too. Uh, so to sum up, design patterns are really good. They're useful and can help make your code reusable and keep consistent designs in your code uh, across all your applications and across other applications at other outfits. Other teams that you talk to will all know what you're talking about when you say things like, we're using the factory pattern or we're using the adapter pattern. That all works the same across different languages and technologies. It's great. Uh, notice that none of the things we did today required third-party libraries. I didn't download any open source modules from anywhere. I didn't download any JavaScript plugins. I didn't run NPM install anything. Uh, this is all just techniques with CF components that you yourself write. You simply take the components, put methods that are named a certain way or do certain things in them, and then hook the components together using that pattern, and you're done. Uh, it does take a little bit of discipline and getting used to to start doing not just design patterns, but also OO programming in general. Um, but it pretty much is the way the world works now. People don't do top-down procedural programming in any sort of modern development way. So it's worth you know, the time it will take you to learn how this stuff works and get it going. Um, it is a good investment in your career and in your application and your code bases and all that stuff. Uh, some other good books and stuff to check out. Um, a few people have already mentioned Luis's book, Modern CFML in 100 Minutes. Uh, that's a really good reference for learning how to write modern CFML. If the stuff we discussed today is maybe a little bit beyond where you're at right now, and you need to have a little bit more of a refresher on what CFCs do and what things like inheritance and composition do, check out Matt Gifford's book, Object-Oriented Programming in Cold Fusion. It's a little bit older, but it does give you a really good intro primer into what a component does and what public and private methods are for and how inheritance works. It's really good for that kind of stuff. Uh, Head First Design Patterns is my absolute favorite OO programming book of any language, of any technology. It's not even close uh, to the point that the duck example I used today and the coffee example I used today, I straight up ripped off out of this book. Um, the demos in Head First Design Patterns are written in Java. Don't let that scare you off. The explanations they give in the Head First series of books are so easy to understand. It is the least dry, most fun developer book I've ever read for any topic. Um, it's OK that the concepts and uh, the code in those books are Java. You'll understand what they're talking about, I promise. The, this book has like crossword puzzles and dot-to-dot -dot puzzles and things you do uh, to learn design patterns in a very, very different way than most super dry development books. This is a super dry development book, but it's a really, really good one. It's uh, typically called the Gang of Four book. The demos in that and the code samples are in like C++ and Smalltalk and other not web development centric languages. But it discusses really good, um, it's got really good examples of when you would use things like the factory pattern and adapter pattern. And so read this if you wanna get excited about design patterns, read this if you need to get a little bit more nerdy and technical about what they do under the hood and pros and cons, it's worth checking out. Uh, like I said, I run South of Shasta. We do training on different things, including OO programming classes. Uh, CFCast.com is a great website you can go to and download some free and some paid uh, video training series to learn OO programming, Coldbox, lots of other great modern web development stuff. Uh, I produced a couple of the series on CFCast.com, and then other super smart people, way smarter than me, have produced most of the others. Um, and again, yeah, if you want more info, just go there, and I've got this presentation is linked up there as well as a link to the GitHub repository, I think, for all the code demo we went over today. Um, <clears throat> I'm a big fan of trying to just block off 30 minutes a day to learn stuff. If you looked at this and you went, oh, good, you know, you know, a lot of good that does me, Nolan, I'm super busy. I don't have time to learn all these things. Um, 
I promise you, if you just block off like 30 minutes a day, turn off the Seinfeld rerun, start with something easy like a singleton pattern and just do a half an hour a day every day until you lock in and learn that pattern. You can learn things in small, you know, regular chunks of training like that. It does work. And with that, I'm done talking. There's my contact info and how to find me on Twitter and all that good stuff. If anyone has um, things they want to chat about more later. And with that, I will look in the Q&A pod over here and see what the questions are with the last couple minutes we have. So Annette asks, what's an example use case for when you would not want to use a singleton? Uh, you would not use a singleton for when you want to make what they call the transient component. So when you want to have new instances of it created every time you need one in your application, like maybe when you have a user logging into your app, uh, I'm going to bet you have more than one user in your app. So every time you have a new user logging in, make a new instance of the user component to track that user's specific stuff. That would be an example of when you might use, um, not when you use a singleton. Uh, Terry asked, would a college CFC extend to faculty, staff, and students? Uh, that's a good question. So the short answer is it depends on what you're doing. Um, I would probably need to know more about what goes inside. No, in fact, I would say no, I would not do it that way, Terry, because um, a good rule of thumb for using extend is uh, another way to describe the extend keyword is that's the is a operator. And you want to be able to basically say in um, a conversation with another person, this component is a whatever the parent component is. It's like in the, in the coffee example I had earlier, I can say espresso is a beverage. That sentence saying out loud makes sense. That's a logical sentence. Espresso is a type of beverage. Um, if you cannot say, if the sentence describing your component doesn't make sense, it's probably a, not a great design idea for using inheritance. So I would never say a student is a type of college. I would never say a faculty is a type of college. Um, so that's probably a sign that like, maybe that's not the right way to design those components. I should take a step back, look at a different way to combine things together instead. Uh, Walter, um, Walter's talking to Mark. Q&A, apologies for missing this before, but will the demo code be available for download? Yes, the demo code is available. Um, here, I'll put that on the screen right there. Demo code is available right there. Uh, just go to GitHub, um, Nolan Irk, and then I think it's probably the most recent repo up there, CFML Design Patterns. Uh, let's see here, Stick, what is your most valuable CF-related album? Most valuable CF-related album. Uh, I actually have a CD of... Um, Another guy who used to run a um, an open source software library that a lot of people have used, one of the one of the Mira folks, um, used to play in a, a band that got really really famous, and I have his old CD on the shelf behind me in the other room, and there's a photo on the back with um, this guy who was like the chief marketing operator, I think, or something like that, and he's got like long hair and wearing like Seattle grunge, uh, you know, flannels and that sort of thing. So that's probably my my most valuable CF related album in my collection. Uh, let's see, just checking to see if there are any more questions in here. I'll try to skim this chat window up above, but there's a lot of stuff in there. I don't know that I'll find anything easily. I think I hear Mark logged back on. Mark, are you there? I am, I am, yeah. yeah I've been here. I've been, you know, quietly watching. <laughs> cool. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate that. Oh, we need to pick a uh, winner. Um, uh, Stick, I like your question about the record album. So we'll go with... Um, Stick, if you and Mark can sort out the details, you can be my winner for the Amex gift card. Absolutely. Okay, Stick. Stick, Stick uh, Hazen, H-A-Z-E-N. Can you please email me so I have your email so that I can have uh, our team send you over that voucher? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Great talk as always, Nolan. Thanks for having love, me. Appreciate it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Wondering how many people we'll have coming to the next talk uh, next year when you do this one again, who have now implemented the singleton pattern. Um, <laughs> I did want to tell you one of my good friends uh, wanted me to tell you that after watching this talk, the last time you did it, they have implemented singleton patterns in their production code. So nice. you are making changes Yay. and making waves <laughs> awesome. um, and improving people's code. So Thank you so much for coming out. Um, I'm going to swap us over to the outro. If people could please vote on how Nolan did, if you got lots and lots of value from this talk, as I'm sure you did, uh, please give us 
votes here. This is really important information for the speakers. They do use it for their, uh, you know, improving the craft, getting better at speaking. So we love to, to, to see that. Um, thank you again, Nolan, so much for coming and joining us and sharing your wisdom. Um, it's been a pleasure having you here. Likewise. So, thank you, sir. Okay. And coming up in about an hour or so from now, we have Dave Ferguson. You handle the crud, let them handle the rest. It's a mystery. He won't tell me what his talk is about, but we will find out. And apparently there are some pretty interesting memes. So please stick around for that. And we will leave this up for just a little bit more to get your votes in and send us back over to the lobby. Thank you. <laughs>